Welcome. Happy Easter. <laughs> if you're new here among us, my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your pastor, and indeed, he is risen. Around 2,000 years ago, time tested. But it seems, even though this has never been disproven, people are always trying to set out to disprove it. For 2,000 years. In addition to that, people are coming up with their own worldviews today. Their own religions. And it just seems like it's all based not in fact, but in fantasy. People can just make up whatever they want, it seems nowadays. So I heard a story about a guy who wanted to start his own religion. So he figures, all right. Here's what I'm going to do. I'll start my own religion, and I'll just make it all about them, right? So you're always going to be happy, healthy, wealthy. Everything's always going to be good. Let's see if I can get people to sign up. So he does. People start to buy it a little bit, but things don't always work out that way. So he's not getting the following he wants. It's kind of a revolving door. And he realizes this is getting expensive in a revolving door, keeping people in here all the time. So... He hires a marketing firm. They're great, and they're happy to take his money. And so they like tweak the religion a little bit. They redesign some stuff. Well, you know, you got to change this a little. And so they kind of smooth it out. They get him an app. <laughs> you know, all the modern things, all the marketing. And so he's kind of keeping people in there, but not the way he wanted. It's still not working. So one day. He's at the marketing firm, and he's angry. He's having an angry meeting with them. You guys need to do your job. I'm paying you a lot of money. Well, in the midst of this, in comes a delivery guy, hand truck full of boxes. And he kind of takes notice of what's going on here. He takes some interest in it. And so he's like unloading the boxes really slowly to listen, right? You know, but quietly, mind his own business. And they're going back and forth, and he just can't help it. He says, I got an idea. And the marketing firm guys are like, the delivery guy? Really? Go away. Just do your job and get out of here. But the guy who wanted to start his own religion says, wait, you know what? I'll listen to just about anything right now. What's your idea? The delivery guy says, oh, you got to get crucified. <laughs> what? <laughs> Won't I die if I do that? Yeah. Just got to make sure you rise from the dead. It worked out really well for this one guy I know. <laughs> Couldn't help himself. All right, so we don't need the laugh track. You guys are like, that was good. That helps me. <laughs> All right. So if you're new here, you don't know. We're usually in a series. We get, we're in a really long series. We're looking at the entire Bible, all the bits and pieces of the Bible that nobody ever looks at. It's really interesting. But I managed to kind of tie it in, and we looked at the crucifixion. We saw Jesus called it his exodus from the world. And so I was kind of explaining to you guys about how all these uh, festivals, these holidays, they all tie in, and Jesus fulfills everything. What we did is we looked at the crucifixion, and this was mainly because... I know a lot of people just can't get here throughout the week. Much smaller crowd for Wednesday Bible study. And by the time Good Friday comes, it's like, uh, you know, we have dinner plans. <laughs> so if you do a Good Friday service, it, it's kind of small. So I was like, you know what? We really need to reflect on this this week. And so we talked about the crucifixion last week. Very somber, but it's good to think about. We can't have Easter, the resurrection, without the crucifixion. So we spent a lot of time talking about that. Now, we're going to talk about the resurrection. I'm just going to focus on the empty tomb account, but there's some stuff that happens in between. So Jesus dies on the cross, and then all these crazy things happen. A lot of people don't think about it. There's a couple different earthquakes, but there's an earthquake. The veil is torn in the temple that separates man from God. There's no more separation, but a lot of people don't know <laughs> that the saints, if you're reading the Greek, the, the holy ones, they rise from the dead, all these people. And they come out and start visiting people. So the Roman centurion, they freak out. And they're like, this is the Son of God. And so you have here a Gentile acknowledging at Jesus' death that he's the Son of God. Kind of interesting. Nobody really talks about that. Then in the meantime, you have these two really just unlikely people going for the body of Jesus. They're going to bury him. Joseph of Arimathea 
and Nicodemus. And they're these like secret followers of Jesus because they're scared of the religious leaders, the Jewish religious leaders. So they go and they get the body and they get like 75 pounds of myrrh and aloe to prepare Jesus' body. They bury him in a tomb carved out of rock. Okay, in the meantime, you have the women. And so this is, I'm going to kind of make this less confusing, there are a lot of Marys. There are many Marys in this account. And so depending on what gospel account you're reading, it seems different. So it's just different mentions, different perspectives. They're kind of watching. Where is he buried? They see where he's buried. But the Jewish leadership, they're worried. So they demand that the tomb be sealed and guarded so that the disciples don't steal the body and take it away. Then they'll say he rose from the dead and will be worse off than before. All this is going on in the background. And now we get to Sunday morning, right? So you get early in the morning, the women arrive. Now, I'm not really going to get into every single one of the Marys and how it probably works out. But, uh, you know, Luke will just be very generic about it. The women from Galilee. So it could be any number of women there, right? So Mark finally gets to this part. Mary Magdalene, Salome, and Mary the mother of James. So many Marys here. So what I did here, and this, is, this will be new to some of you who've never been here before. I made a chart. <laughs> so anyway, the Bible is not in chronological order. So that can be confusing for people anyway. Right? So not in chronological order. You get to the Gospels, and it's four different perspectives, angles, on Jesus' life and ministry. But one will come along and decide to give one detail, the other another detail. In addition to the books not being in chronological order, they're not told in chronological order. They're, they don't work that way, really. So even with a, in a certain event, it's almost like they're saying, oh, well, oh, yeah, and then Peter did that. But they don't give you the perfect and exact timeline. So this is a chronological-ish <laughs> look at these accounts. Even scholars, they, they'll kind of disagree about certain parts. So this is most likely what happened. And so I want to point out a few things, especially about the women here, that a lot of people really don't take into account. So the women, they can set out now to prepare Jesus' body, right? So they want to find it, but then they're thinking like, oh, wait a minute, how do we roll the stone away, right? So we're not going to be able to do that. And that's kind of the conversation going on. In the meantime, an angel appears. There's another earthquake. There's an earthquake, an angel appears, and just frightens the guards. So they're like, And they faint. They just pass out. They're so scared, right? So the women continue on, and you have the women finding the stone rolled away. That's one phase. So the stone is rolled away. It's a big tomb, or stone on the front of the tomb. But you have these different kind of sequences going on. So what probably happens is Mary Magdalene runs and gets Peter. So they haven't seen anything yet. They just figure, well, you know, Jesus' body's gone. But The stone's rolled away. Peter, come help. Then in the Gospel of John, you get this kind of, I find it funny, but John places himself in a race with Peter to the tomb. It's kind of funny. And then he like wins the race and makes sure that he says that. So it's kind of interesting, right? So he kind of peeks in, sees what's going on. You know, the body's not there, but Peter, he goes in first. And there's linen wrappings there, especially the face cloth, and it's nice and folded up. Why? Well, Who's going to steal the body and take the time? Hold on, let me do their laundry, okay? So, like, imagine having your TV stolen. You look around, they'd be like, wow, but they did all the laundry and they folded the towels, right? So so nobody's going to see that. you got to think like modern, right? So why add that in there? That's why, right? No, if someone's going to steal something, they're not going to do your laundry. So it's nice and neat there. It has not been stolen. Okay, but it's kind of interesting at this point because... (laughs) <laughs> they go. They're like, well, you know, John says, yeah, I believed, you know. And Peter, I don't know, he didn't get the scriptures, right? So they went back home. They just leave. That's interesting. Remember that one. So now you have the women kind of discovering two things. There's a man in a white robe, and this gets really confusing. And they see the man in the white robe, and they kind of discover the empty tomb. Then two angels appear. And they just focus on one of the angels talking. And when you mash it together, it's something like, hey, you know, we know you're looking for Jesus here who was crucified, but he is risen. Now, just think about something, and we'll get back to this later. If you're in church for a long time, he is risen. He is risen indeed, right? So you know that, right? But a lot of people don't picture this. The angel is saying this to the women. That's interesting. It's not Peter. Kind of funny, right? So we'll get back to that and the significance of that. There's actually a very large significance. So 
And then you have a scene, and it's very hard to tell. Either the larger group of women then leave to tell the disciples, or they're still there, and then Mary's there, and she's weeping. Why are you weeping, right, the angels say. Then they say what I just said, but then again, like, you know, why are you weeping? Well, Mary thinks the gardener's behind her. Like, so if you've taken his body, just tell me where you've taken the body. And she's weeping. And then she turns around, and he says, Mary, it's Jesus. Rabboni, which means teacher. Like, and she clings to him, like, don't cling to me. I have not yet ascended to my father, right? So my God and your God. So go tell the disciples what you've seen. She's going to do that. She races off. Probably another scene, either the whole large group of women or the group of women run into Jesus, either again or they run into Jesus, right? and they worship him. And basically, he says the same thing. Go and tell my brethren. Meet him in Galilee, right? So that's interesting. So there's a couple of different rounds of this going on. But Jesus' first two appearances are to women. Now, that will be significant later as we talk more about it. So you guys did that risen and deep thing really, really well. I mean, that was good, I got to say. All right. <laughs> okay. So yeah, that, that was a long section there. So Jesus does appear to others on the Emmaus Road, Cleopas and friend. All right, so there's a few other appearances that go on here. Uh, Thomas, the disciples, different appearances. We go along. So we're just going to get to this, though. They eventually come to believe, these people. But here's what Mark says, Mark 16, 9. After Jesus rose from the dead early on Sunday morning, the first person who saw him was Mary Magdalene, the woman from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went to the disciples, who were grieving and weeping, and told them what had happened. But when she told them that Jesus was alive and she had seen him, they didn't believe her. Afterward, he appeared in different form to two of his followers who were walking from Jerusalem into the country. They rushed back to tell the others, but no one believed them. Still later, he appeared to the 11 disciples as they were eating together. He rebuked them for their stubborn unbelief because they refused to believe those who had seen him after he had been raised from the dead. Interesting. Now, if we look at what happened between Jesus' appearance to the women in that Emmaus encounter, we see this, Matthew 29, 11. As the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and told the leading priest what had happened. A meeting with the elders was called, and they decided to give the soldiers a large bribe. They told the soldiers, you must say Jesus' disciples came during the night while we were sleeping, and they stole his body. And if the governor hears about it, we'll stand up for you, and we won't get in trouble. So the guards accepted the bribe and said what they were told to say. Their story spread widely among the Jews, and they still tell it today. Indeed, they still tell it today. There's a lot of that going on. People trying to dispel this whole thing. And they come up with their theories. People are trying to take down Christianity actively. But for those of you who are like, ah, it's new, it's nothing new. It's been going on right from the beginning. So it's interesting. I'm not into a lot of Christian movies because they're usually kind of low-budget and cheesy. Let's just be honest about it, right? So, so the other thing is, like, I'm a real Bible nerd, and, like, think of your favorite book. Say, the Bible, of course, right? All right, but your second favorite book, you know, and you know everything about it, and then someone makes a movie about it, and it's annoying, right? Because they get stuff wrong, and you're like, no, 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 no. Like, it's wrong. So, but that's one thing for some person, right? You get Harry Potter wrong, whatever, right? And someone's like, whatever. You know, right? you're like, yeah. Serious, <laughs> right? But you get Jesus wrong, I'm not happy. Like, I get really unhappy about that. So I just generally don't like, like Bible movies. I, I don't because they usually get something wrong, and I'm like, Ugh! like not good at all. But there's this one movie called Case for Christ, and it's a true story about a guy named Lee Strobel. And you've got to picture him like a lawyer, investigative journalist. And the basic premise is he sets out, and just true, to disprove Christianity. He's like, that's it. I'm going to disprove it. Smart guy. Get rid of this religion, right? Okay, so he goes and sets out and interviews all these people. And some of them are just, you know, they're, they're real famous people like William Lane Craig, Gary Habermas, like scholars I like to listen to. And, you know, he's going through the thing and he ends up flipping and becoming a Christian. He sees all the evidence and he's like, oh, 
this is true. <laughs> and then he becomes a believer and writes the book. I have a little pamphlet if you want one after the service. It's a condensed version, Case for Christ. The movie's called The Case for Christ. And so it's actually a really good movie. It was well done, well produced, and it's just excellent, uh, during, especially during these times when people are trying to knock Christianity. But here's the thing. The real important thing is the resurrection. So he's like, okay, basically, how do I take it down? How do I disprove it? Well, you disprove the resurrection. If the resurrection didn't happen, no Christianity. You just got people going around trying to be nice because Jesus was. Okay, anybody can do that, right? The resurrection, that's it. It all hinges on that. So, going back to the Bible, you know anything about the Bible? Let's see. Everybody in here has heard 1 Corinthians at a wedding, 13. Ah, you've heard that. So frame of reference, Paul's writing to the church in Corinth. There's actually a lot of problems there, so it's kind of funny that they read that at a wedding because you hope that there's going to be no problems in the wedding. Anyway, context guide. You go ahead a couple chapters, and Paul starts talking about the resurrection. It's important. Some are saying it didn't happen or it's not going to happen or it's not, you know, whatever. So he needs to teach him about the resurrection. So 1 Corinthians 15.1 let me now remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before. You welcomed it then, and you still stand firm in it. This is the good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you, unless, of course, you believe something that was never true in the first place. I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the Scripture said. He was buried and then was raised from the dead on the third day. Just as the scripture said, he was seen by Peter and then the 12. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles, last of all, as though I had been, it might say, untimely born in your version, born at the wrong time, I also saw him. Paul lays out the facts. These are the facts. And we'll get back to this in a minute or two because it's really important. He's laying it out, simplifying the gospel and saying, these are the basics, guys. This happened. We have witnesses to this. Now he continues, 1 Corinthians 15, 12. But tell me this, since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying there will be no resurrection of the dead? For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. And we apostles would be lying about God. For we have said that God raised Christ from the grave. But that can't be true if there's no resurrection of the dead. And if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. A lot of gravity there, right? Almost repetitive here. Our hope is not in this life. It's in the resurrection. Important. But this is extremely important. If the resurrection didn't happen, your faith is worthless. You are wasting your time. I'm wasting mine. That's what Paul's saying. All right? So indeed... Just like back then, there are those today who are setting out or saying, it didn't happen. Your faith is worthless. You're stupid, right? So that's what's going on in the world today and then. So back to Peter. <laughs> After Peter gets it, right? so he writes a couple letters that make it into the New Testament. So Peter knows this, that people are going to be doing this. Also, at this time now, there are people suffering for being a Christian. They're being persecuted tortured harbor. When we get to Nero, they're being set on fire for what they believe, these fiery trials that you're, you're experiencing. So amidst this, and probably a little bit before that time, Peter is just encouraging them, right? Yes, you're going to suffer, just as Christ did. You're called to it, but encouraging them. He's giving them hope. He's also telling them how to deal with these people. Do we start an army? See, Peter got that one wrong. He tried to like Cut Malchus's ear off, Jesus had to heal it, right? So wrong, <laughs> wrong way to do it, Peter. So now Peter gets it. So here's what he says, 1 Peter 3.13. Now, who will want to harm you if you're eager to do good? But even if you suffer for doing what is right, God will reward you for it. So don't worry or be afraid of their threats. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks you about your hope as a believer, 
always be ready to explain it. But do it in a gentle and respectful way. So there's a reason he threw that in there. <laughs> As a pastor, I know why. But the word is apologia in Greek. So it means to make a defense. You're making a stand. You're making a defense about something. And when you say the word like, you know, if I'm telling you guys, hey, get ready to make a defense, what, what comes in your mind? We're going to have a fight, right? That's what comes in your mind. If you've got to defend yourself, well, you're in a fight now, okay? So let's go. Not that kind of defense. So this is why Peter, like, but, but wait, <laughs> wait, but do it in a gentle, the opposite of fighting, gentle and respectful way. Right? So what's the idea here? Well, I've said this before here. I've never won an argument. I've never won an argument. <laughs> never. It just never happened. We always go away. Okay, you know, and the best, the best that ever ends is, that's fine, we have to agree to disagree. Right? That's the best, but usually not. <laughs> There's like all kinds of arguing. So I'm done. I'm done arguing, right? So the only one I'm going to like do the apologia with is like someone who comes and actually just wants to hear what I have to say and listen. Otherwise, I, whatever. You know, and I, I told you, like Ezekiel and Paul, the blood is not on my hands. Like that's it. I'm not arguing with you anymore, right? So Peter knows that that's how we get. He knows that, right? So, okay, listen, explain this Christianity stuff, but love them, <laughs> love them, honor them, right? <laughs> you just got done saying, honor authorities and the king or the emperor, the guy who's burning you, honor him, right? So really important, right? This is how we do it. We love people into the faith, really important. So he knows to say, but do it in a gentle and respectful way, really important. You catch more flies with honey, right? So disciple-making is really important. So here we get to the how. When I say disciple-making, like you know, making more followers of Jesus is important. So Jesus, the risen Jesus, will tell them, this is how Matthew ends, Matthew 28, right? Go and make disciples of all, your version might say nations, but you can change it, to ethnicities, right? So ethne, the word in Greek is ethne. It gets translated Gentiles sometimes because they're different ethnicities, peoples, nations. But it's not just going like, hey, we need you to go to this specific place. You know, the Holy Spirit will take care of that. But now it's not just open to the Jews. It's open to all people now. Everybody now is getting in. Ethne is the word in Greek, ethnicities. So it was important to Jesus. <laughs> we want more wheat than weeds. <laughs> we want this thing to grow. We want it to spread. It's important. Now, not everybody's a missionary, but to the people around us, we want to spread it. We want to love our neighbor, right? So not everybody has that gift. Not everyone's an apostle, a sent one, right? Not like a title we should have today, but something we do, right? Not everybody, but love your neighbor, right? That's that's how we get them over to this side. Just love them. That's it. So that's the point. Now, here's what I'm going to do today because there are a couple different categories of people, especially if you're new, right? So you're skeptical. A lot of people struggle with their faith. We saw through this series, Peter struggled with his faith. People struggle with their faith a little bit. And so we learn Romans 10, 17, faith comes through hearing the gospel. Faith comes through hearing. So it's got to get in here, and you need to understand and have reasonable faith before it goes down here. It doesn't start here. It starts with the facts. What did Paul just do? He gave them what? He didn't say, just believe, because I believe. No. <laughs> he gave them the facts again. It's not the way it works, right? So that's not faith. There's like a reasonable faith. So faith comes through, and this is defined in the Bible. Faith comes through, not just faith. Right? No. Faith comes through hearing, hearing the words about Christ, right? And so then it gets in here. So for you, if you're a skeptical today, and that's okay, a believer, kind of like you're struggling a little bit, you have the TV on too much, turn it off, and right, unless there's like a Jesus movie playing. So, but anyway, you know, you got this stuff in your head. And in the world, it's like, it seems convincing. He seems smart. He has a lot of money. He must know what he's talking about. And just, you know, it just gets all scrambled up. But I said to you before as a church, and if you're new here, the media is designed to agitate a weaker faith. That's what it's designed to do. It's just everything. Everything out there is designed to make you worry about your stuff. That's it. If I had to boil it all down, worry about your stuff. Jesus says what? The opposite. Don't worry about your stuff. Just focus on the heavenly prize. That's it, right? You're going to rise from the dead. That's way better than your car, whatever it is you think is cool right now. Right? That's it. So, you got stuff in your head. 
So let's look at the facts. I want to present a few of the facts to you guys. And then if you brought an unbeliever with you, it's okay. Like, we have food afterwards, and there's plenty of nice places to eat. Stop thinking about where you're going to get food afterwards. <laughs> All right? So it's okay. But maybe you just don't believe, and you're like, you got dragged here. I'm going to give you some facts. Right? And so hopefully some of them will sink in. So I'm going to, like, scatter some seeds, and we'll see if any sinks in here. So... This is something worth, worth kind of talking about because people don't often think about it. And if you haven't studied other worldviews, so just really quick, uh, you know, I didn't, I wasn't like born a pastor, right? I'm not a pastor's kid, nothing like that. I was born Catholic and we were extremely religious. And if you're Catholic, that's totally cool. It's fine. Just as long as you believe that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, you're good to go. Any of that other stuff that you're doing, fine. Protestants do a lot of stuff too. So <laughs> we, they, you might worship the Pope, they worship Martin Luther. You both got your problems. Anyway, <laughs> I'm just saying, like, stop, right? Is Jesus your Lord and Savior? Yes, you're good. You're getting in, right? So <laughs> we're good, right? But maybe you just don't believe any of that. And you know what? A lot of this has turned you off. Maybe you don't want to believe because these Christians are crazy. They're judgmental. They're hypocritical. All they do is argue. Yeah, that's actually totally true. So anyway, but you know, I'm going to give you some stuff. So here's the first thing. When you're exploring worldviews, I didn't start out again as a, as a PK, Catholic, fell way away from the faith. I was actually into Satanism at one point, Taoism, like everything. I've studied all of them, right? So that's it. And in pastor school, you got to look at them all too. So the interesting thing is this. This is what it really boils down to, is that when you look at Christianity, I shouldn't say all it boils down to, when you look at Christianity, it's based on witness testimony. Now, that seems like obvious, like of course it's going to be based, but it's not. When you look at other worldviews, they're not. Right? So you can knock off quite a few of them by, they start by some guy has some kind of experience somewhere, right, or says he does, and then nobody sees it, there's no evidence, there's no facts, he goes and tells a bunch of people who just believe him. That's it. That's how you get you know, like at least two major worldviews right now. That's it, or three. And they just believe them. That's it. And then that person writes a book or writes it all down, and everyone just believes what that person wrote because I said so. Christianity is not designed that way. It never was. Christianity is based on witness testimony. It's one of the very few. And I'm not going to say like the only because I don't know of every single worldview, but I would say probably the only worldview that's based on witness testimony, and certainly the only one that's based on a pile of witness testimony when we compare it to other things. So that's really, really important. Now, when you look at the New Testament, a lot of people just don't understand what it is. The Bible isn't like, it's just written straight through, right? No, it's made up of different books. So the New Testament, let's we'll talk about that, keep it simple. 27 books. And scholars will call these books witnesses. So if you're listening carefully to a lot of scholars, they'll say, oh, they're witnesses. Because they're witnesses. That's what they are, right? So it's very, very important here to understand that. The Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they're ancient Greco-Roman biographies, that's their literary genre, about the life and ministry of Jesus. They're witnessing to him. They knew him or knew people who knew him. Matthew, Levi, the tax collector, an apostle, capital A apostle. He knew him. Mark, probably a young boy at that time. We read about him in Acts and his mom. So Mark saw some of this stuff, right? Luke, Dr. Luke, a traveling companion of Paul. He interviewed everybody for his accounts. Important. John, an apostle. He's the guy who won the race. <laughs> so John, he knew Jesus in the flesh. These are witnesses writing about Jesus. Dr. Luke gives us Acts. Then you get 13 letters by the apostle Paul. He's writing to churches as a witness to people who are witnesses, some of them. Some of them, people who are not. Right? So then you get what? Peter, Hebrews. We don't know who wrote it, but whatever. Right? So James, Jesus' brother, kind of a witness. Right? Peter, definitely a witness. Two books from him. Three books from John. Again, John comes in. Jude, one of the apostles. Witnesses. John, again, prophetic book, Revelation. So they're witnesses. Now, what's really interesting is the women. They're witnesses. And now, in today, I was actually talking to my wife about this, and she says it's still remarkable today. 
because <laughs> she's like, men are chauvinists, you know. So, like, yeah, that would be really remarkable that, you know, because I was like, you know, today women are doing everything. And I can't remember what I was watching, and someone was challenged to, like, name, like, more than two uh, superhero movies where, like, the women were the star, and they were like, no, oh, there's more than that, and they go through the list, and they're like, you're right, there's two women superhero movies, right? So it's still kind of uneven, and my wife pointed this out. It's still remarkable today that the women are the witnesses. It's still remarkable, but back then, it's even crazier because women were not allowed to be witnesses in a court of law. So if you had a woman, she can stand up for you, you can't bring her in. No. Now think about this for a second. Think about this for a second. Like, let's go back a little bit. All right, so what's one of the charges? Maybe, you know, the Bible, they just made it up. Okay, if you're going to make up a story, <laughs> okay, right, Peter. So instead of the followers of Jesus, you know, they have so much faith burying their Lord, they have two Pharisees doing it, you know, like two Jews doing it. They were secret disciples, not at all proud. So they're flipped at this point. What? That's kind of embarrassing on their part, isn't it? But then the women. The women are the first witnesses. <laughs> go tell the disciples. Even Jesus says to them, go tell the disciples. Like, you know, he's, he knows they don't believe, so he's like, whatever. I'm not talking to them right now, right? He didn't say that. But, but anyway, they're the witnesses. And they're, they're not believed right away. And that's kind of natural, right? Not today, but, but then it would have been natural. That's extraordinary. So a lot of scholars will point to this and say, this is, they're including all this stuff because it really happened. They're just sitting there going, this really happened, even if it's at a cost to them of great shame and personal embarrassment. That happens in there. So there's one thing to think about. Witnesses. So... <clears throat> It's also written during the witness period. Here's the other charge. The Bible's like a game of telephone, and it just got passed on, passed on, passed on. It was written hundreds of years later. Eh, wrong answer. I just told you. It was written by witnesses in a witness period. Now, that might not seem like a big deal today because on your phone, you have everything that is happening in the whole world as it happens, right? So it's right there. That's not the way ancient history works takes a while. Paper's really expensive. They it's just nobody was writing things immediately afterwards. And in fact, this is true. So I've done this before. I do like to do this on Easter because it's a good one. But Alexander the Great. So I know everyone here is like, here we go again. <laughs> but if you're new, just, you know what? You don't have it memorized, so listen. All right? So Alexander the Great, right? If you challenge someone like, do you believe that he existed, right? It, most people are going to go, yeah, of course. Okay. Well, here's the thing. The things that we have written for Alexander, that we are in possession of, right? So you have Life of Alexander by Plutarch, written around 100 AD. What's the problem with that? Well, if you know anything about Alexander, he died in 323 BC. 400 years. That way. <laughs> Back. Right? So you have Alexander written about in the Library of History, about 300 years. So you're waiting 300, but really 400 years to get anything like the Gospels, and there's only one of them. That's it. One. One thing written. And we wait. The author is writing 400 years later. He's not a witness. That's all we have for, for the early stuff for Alexander. That's it. <laughs> but you just said you believed in him. No problem. All right. You got 27 witnesses to Jesus, all actual witnesses in a witness period. What's more credible? This is why Lee Strobel flipped. Wait a minute. When you look at the documentation for anything else in that time of history, the New Testament blows everything out of the water, just the sheer volume. You think about Plato, you heard of him? Aristotle, you got like 7 and 47 of their works. That's it. Homer's Iliad, I think, is like the, the highest one outside the Bible. There's like 680-something cop copies of Homer's Iliad. Right? You might know what that is. But that's it. You might say, that's a lot. Nope. The New Testament, 6,000. And we're finding more all the time. 6,000 manuscripts. That's crazy. And they're all like in 95% agreement with one another. That's really hard to do. They're copying it by hand. They are getting it right. It's just like little nuances. Nothing changes the story. There is literally nothing like it in ancient history. 
If we can believe any of that other stuff, we have like 6,000 more times the reason, right? So 27 witnesses, 27 t- more times reason, whatever you want to do, however you want to put it, to believe this, to believe this. So there are your facts, a wealth of information. I want to go back to 1 Corinthians. When you go to 1 Corinthians, it's a very interesting letter because it's an interesting letter. A lot of stuff going on there. But also, it's one of these letters, if you're a polygeeing, you're <laughs> arguing with the professor, if they know what they're talking about, if they know history, they will tell you 1 Corinthians, even secular scholars, don't believe Jesus. We'll acknowledge that it's written by Paul. It's a real historical letter. He's somebody important in the church. The people he talks about are real. Secular scholars will acknowledge this. They'll give you that one, in other words. They'll say it's all real. They just stop short of the resurrection. So scholars call this like historical gold. There's nothing else like it. This is probably written about 25 years after the cross. In ancient history, absolutely nothing even close. Nothing. It's unbelievable. It's a primary document. So if you study history at all, you're like, ooh, that is good. So really important. So let's go back to it and look at it. 1 Corinthians 15, 4. He, Jesus was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as Scripture said. He was seen by Peter and then the twelve. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles. Last of all, although I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. So now that you know that, you look at it a little differently, hopefully. He's pointing to, go ask, go ask, go ask. 500 people, some are still alive. This is no lie. This is no lie. Historians, even if they don't believe in Jesus, they'll be like, yep, like this is, this is a primary document. He's calling out the witnesses. This is a big deal in history. And it's incredible because when you look at like Alexander the Great, the author can't do that. They're definitely, well, definitely dead, right? You know, right? So that's it. Paul can. And this is something in ancient history just does not exist. It's unique to the New Testament. So here are the facts. Let's let these sink in before we close today. Jesus claimed to be God. He claimed to be God. This is a fact. People who say he didn't, they don't know what they're talking about. I and the Father are one, says that John. He claimed to be God. It got him killed. The high priest, that's, what, that's the final thing. That's what he asks him. Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? I am. Now, it doesn't sound like he's saying anything there, but if you know your Bible, go back to Exodus 3.14. That's the name God assigned himself when he was talking to Moses. What do I say you are? I am. There's power in those words when Jesus says it. I am. I am he. People fall down. Power. I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right of the power, coming with the clouds of heaven. He's recalling Daniel 7, saying, I fulfill that scripture. I am God. I am the king of the eternal kingdom. And it gets him killed. They know what he's saying. It's clear. Jesus' existence and death are documented historically. Not just by, and that's enough, the New Testament authors. That's plenty. But other historians, Tacitus, Josephus, they acknowledge Jesus existed. He died. Acknowledged. But then we see Jesus rose from the dead. And we have more evidence to the resurrection than anything else in this time period in history. It's a fact. That's it. And here's the really amazing thing, if that isn't mind-blowing. This was all predicted in the Old Testament in many many ways, and Jesus fulfilled it all. Amazing. So what does this mean to you? Believers. If you're a believer, you get the application, then you can eat. If you, I, well, I'll tell you that later. I almost, my wife's like, no, 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 don't talk about pizza again. It's very easy to get me talking about pizza. It's like, no problem at all. So, <laughs> like, so I get, like, just like I did. Now she's like, talk 
It's about pizza again in the sermons. <laughs> For believers, right? So here's your application. Here's what your homework. <laughs> For believers. Get out there and spread this good news. The statement people have to stop saying, especially if they're Christians. My religion, right? So, you know, my, my, it's, a, it's a personal thing. It's between me and Jesus. Said Jesus, never. Said Jesus, never. It's a personal thing only, right? So it's like, it's just between, I should clarify, between me. Like, it's not between me and anybody else. Wrong. Wrong. <laughs> okay, we may not all be apostles, extent ones. We are all commanded. We are all commanded to share our faith with others. That is a command. It's not optional. Jesus puts it in kind of a scary way, right? If you, he says, if you deny me, and furthermore, don't acknowledge me before man, I won't acknowledge you before the Father. What? So I'm not trying to, like, scare anybody today. You're like, he's ruining Easter, too. Like, I ruined Christmas. <laughs> like, I ruined the holidays. I did. I successfully ruined Christmas. It's like, no one's coming <laughs> next Christmas Eve. <laughs> anyway, so, try, not trying to ruin Easter, right? <laughs> but anyway, it's true. I, I got to say, I have to preach the truth. That's my job, right? So it's true. Don't deny Jesus, all right? Get out there and love people into the faith. Do so. Kindly and gently. Love people. Find an opportunity to love someone and then tell them why you're doing it. I am a horrible person. There's only one good person. He died for you and me <laughs> so that we can rise from the dead. There you go. It's going to sound weird, so you might want to just like love him a little bit before you hit him with all that. It's <laughs> no reason we got to do it. <laughs> okay. Now, here's the thing. If you're new, if you don't believe, if you're hanging in the belt, you're like, I don't know. Still not convinced. He's kind of a funny guy. Sometimes not, but I don't believe him. Don't, right? So go read your Bible. You don't have to believe me. So I see people here with their Bibles checking my work. Could be lying to you. But here's what I'm not lying about. Christ brings greater purpose than our own. When we serve the Most High King, that's it. We're working for the best of the best. Nothing better than that. And here's the thing. When we do these other worldviews, we engage in these other things, we try to make ourselves gods. It's the problem in the first place in the garden. And here's the thing. People, you will always disappoint you. Others will always disappoint you. When you put your faith or your hope in stuff, in people, in other things like that, you will always be disappointed. You will always be disappointed. You can't think of one worldly thing that I'm not going to knock down. It's a worldly thing. It's going to rust and destroy. So you want to store your treasure in heaven with the Lord. He never disappoints. Never. So if you're tired of that, Living a life void of real purpose. You don't feel like you have a purpose. And you're like, no, oh, I got a purpose, but, you know, there's this other thing that I've been working really hard to do. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah, I'm good, but you know, when I get there, I'll be better. <laughs> okay, let's see how that works out. You're struggling with that. If you're tired of being in relationships with others that are shallow or wrong, relationships with sin, which is just compounding this feeling, just anxiety, regret, shame, and it goes over and over. Well, I'll just change the other person. I'll change the other thing. But you keep going through the same cycle again and again. If you want true meaning, serve the eternal king. He'll never, he's not going to stop being on the throne. He's the king. That's it. He can't be dethroned. You will never be disappointed. Never. A lot of that stuff will just go away. And it should. You're invited into a relationship with Jesus, if you're not already this morning. I invite you into a relationship with Jesus and into a relationship with the family of faith. Those of us who believe this, who work for the king, 
we love you. It doesn't matter what you've done, where you've come from. I can tell my story, you'd be like, wow, I don't care. I do care, but I'm not holding it against you. It's all right. And if, and if you struggle, we have people that are part of this church, we treat them as family, right? So everybody's got the weird uncle and the, like, you know, kid that's not doing so good. You know, like, it's good, we're good, though. We're like, you're still the kids, right? You're still my kids. So it's all right. Land of misfit toys. Like, so it's, it's fine. We embrace that here. We embrace it. Everyone's kind of at a different stage, right? We embrace that. That's the family of faith. We love you. It doesn't matter. We love you. It's all good. You're welcome here. Jesus offers us a better purpose. And as he rose from the dead, we live with the joy and the hope that we too, if we believe in him, will also rise from the dead. And that is what Easter is all about. So you're invited. So I want to do a little something here. So if you've just heard the gospel, you've heard the good news about Jesus Christ. And if maybe the information starting to make its way into your heart a little bit, I want to invite you into a prayer, a simple prayer. If you're a longtime Christian, you already believe, it's nice to reaffirm our faith sometimes. We all struggle here and there. And so I'm going to invite you to reaffirm your faith together with me. All right, so let, let's pray this prayer. Father, I know that my sins have separated me from you. I am truly sorry, and I want to turn away from my past sinful life toward you. Please forgive me and help me to avoid sinning again. I believe that your Son, Jesus Christ, died for my sins, was resurrected from the dead. He's alive, and here's my prayer. I devote myself to Jesus. Lord of my life, to rule and reign in my heart from this day forward. Please send your Holy Spirit to help me obey you and to do your will for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. So uh, before we close, I'm just going to, uh, I got to tell you some of the things that we do here if you're new um, and invite you to lunch. <laughs> so <laughs> if you're new here, you don't really know about us. I think Tony's here, Tony or Ed, so they'll tell you, kind of give you some instructions. We'll sing one more song and you can be on your way. That's okay. Um, but I uh, just want to let you know kind of some of the things that we're doing here. Next steps. So if you're a local, like, okay, great, I accepted Jesus. What now? Right? If you're local here in Naples or you live kind of close within driving distance, um, <clears throat> What we do here, there's plenty of what next opportunities for you here. Right? So we operate here as the body of Christ. Right? So we don't have a gigantic staff. You know, my wife works. Like, so, you know, like it, we try to get you guys operative in the body of Christ, doing things. Right? So it's really important to be plugged in. We don't want you doing life alone. And there are so many different things that you can do, so many different things. It, it, we run a building here. It's a 17,000-square-foot building. A lot goes on, so it takes a lot to do that if you've ever been a part of anything like that. One of the things that we do is our cafe. And so I encourage you, even if you have lunch plans, I totally get it, is the stairway there and the stairway there. Go up to the cafe. It's a really cool kind of community center. doesn't look churchy. It's kind of neat, and we're going to have food up there. It's big ziti, and I hear it's delicious. Okay, so <laughs> inside joke. But anyway, so we got food that's going to be gone. So a pastor likes to go, blessed are the pizza makers. That's what I always say. <laughs> anyway, it doesn't say that, but I say that. So, <laughs> so we do a lot of things for the community in our cafe. It's a connecting point, right? So a lot of people, like, they're like, I'll burn up if I go in church. Or they're worried they're going to get hit with the bait in spirit, or it's going to be weird. So it's not weird, as you saw. I mean, I'm weird, but it's not really that weird. So we use our cafe. We have a heart for those in recovery, those in need, those experiencing homelessness. This is actually a problem in Naples. It's just one that all the politicians like to sweep under the rug. I know I'm honoring my, the politicians, but guys, you got to pick it up and answer my emails. So anyway, right, so there's, they'll never watch this, but there's, there's problems here, and Naples doesn't like to acknowledge the problems, and a lot of people, if you're visiting, that's why, right, so if you're on vacation here, you're like, I didn't see any problems, exactly, but there are lots of problems, even wealthy people have problems, and so that's why we have a heart for people 
in recovery from addiction because that's one of our big problems. Y'all drink too much down here. So <laughs> two, two drinks, two. That's it. Jesus drank. I know it's the first miracle, Pastor. Yeah, but it, <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm like, enough. All right, anyway, big problem, <laughs> right? If you can't, don't, right? Just none better <laughs> that way. But we have a heart for those who are saying, you know what, this has messed my life up. I want to get better. And so the cafe, we open it up for people. They can have recovery meetings up there. And it's kind of cool because it doesn't feel like a punishment. It's a nice, cool place. We serve really, 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 really good coffee up there. It's because my wife basically designed the whole thing. So I got to say that. Anyway, <laughs> so we like to work with other nonprofits and organizations. And so people in need, practically, yes, donations help. They help, but they're going to the right place. They're going to the community, right? So nonprofit. We're dealing with a lot of people either in need of the other places that they can use our place. We had a movie day. A mental health organization came in here, and they showed everybody a movie, and then we had, they had lunch up there in the cafe. So we like to do things, show love. Even the school districts, I showed one time, you know, that they actually, we, we donated some supplies the kids actually needed, um, and it got gritty. It was, you know, feminine products for middle school kids, you know, but we sent them everything they needed, and the, they wrote us a letterhead and acknowledged God. A secular school, acknowledge God. Thank you for showing the love of God in this community. That's how you do it. And I'm not saying we're like the best or anything, but that's how it's done, through, through love, right? So that's what we're all about here. So if you're local, uh, you're going to be told how to connect with us. Please do that. I want to get to know you. Uh, for those who live afar, just a couple quick words, and then I'll close today. Uh, if you made that decision in your heart, here's a really important thing. All right, get a Bible and read it. All right, so I preach from the NLT. I am a Greek nerd. The best translation is the original. I like to read that. But even with that being said, I know like, it's hard to understand, right? So get an NLT or something that makes it easy to understand. It'll give you the general point. And read your Bible. Don't believe anybody. Just read your Bible. Don't believe me. Go home and check all my work. That's why it's funny. They actually do that here. It's really funny. And I don't mind at all because the Bible tells us to do that. We're supposed to be reading the scriptures, right? We need to understand it. It's also God's love letter to us. That's what this is, right? We don't want to ignore it. We want to read it. This is, this is our eternal father wrote this year. So come on, you know, God, right? Holy Spirit inspired. I'm not going to get technical now. So, <laughs> but anyway, this is it basically. So read this. That's important. Then get yourself to a church. You need community. Church cannot be done alone. The very word means assembly. It means to assemble. So this whole doing church from home thing, that's not church. Like you cannot do that. It's, it literally means to assemble with the body of believers. You, we, you, we, we help each other through this walk. We're here to help one another and encourage one another. And that's important. The devil, he wants us by ourselves, right? So, but no, we need to do life with others and get ourselves in a community. And then get yourself plugged in. Serve. When you look for a church, really important things. It's not about the production. It's about the people. If it looks like a show, it is. That's it. <laughs> right? If you feel like you're being entertained, <laughs> that's not good. Right? And it's cool. You can go to a Christian rock concert. You can go to other things and have that experience. But that's not church. That's not church. That's a show. And so, and here's the other thing. Now, you got to give me like three chances, right? But if the pastor doesn't know you, <laughs> he's not your pastor. Pastor doesn't know you, and you've been there for a while. Give me a break, guys. Like, it takes me like a few times, because what happens? I get done with this. It's kind of draining mentally, right? So I get done with this, and everybody's like, and I'm like, I don't remember one single thing anybody just said to me right now. It's a lot, right? But you know, if you know me, I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying, and I'll get your name in a month or so. Like, that's it. But everybody who considers themselves a member here, you ask them, they know me. I know something about them, right? We know each other. We're friends, except you guys who like, phew, you dart out the door like that. I'm not that fast, okay? So I'm getting old. <laughs> but anyway, anyone who wants to, we know each other. We're friends. We hang out. We eat together up there. I'm your pastor. I text you. Sometimes you don't like it and you go, stop, right? But, <laughs> but anyway, that happened, <laughs> right? But they have my number. Ask them. We talk. Monday through Friday, 7 to 7. Don't bother me on Saturdays. I'm trying to rest. So, <laughs> but anyway, you find, find a place where the pastor is not trying to be a rock star or rich. Right? Somebody maybe been there, done that, or never even cared about that. They want to be your pastor for real. All right? That's what you're looking for. Relationship this way, relationship that way. A generous church. A church that places Jesus in higher importance than anyone else. 
Thank you for coming this morning. I'm honored that you took the time to spend your Easter with us. Again, you can tell me your name up in the cafe after the service. I'll do my best to remember it for next year. <laughs> I gotta start taking pictures of people. <laughs> it's gonna get weird. All right, so you made it. <laughs> Happy Easter. He is risen. Thank you for coming. God bless you all. Amen.